the most high. Amen and amen. Yeah. Would you give a mighty hand clap to the Lord? Just help me appreciate Dr. Ron. Thank you, sir. Here in Florida, um, this church happens to be, um, I think, the second church that opened, open, opened her door to me in Florida. Um, this great man of God and I met, I was invited to come and do a taping for TBN. And when I got there, I saw this highly impressionable man and... And first thing that comforted me was the fact that he was looking much more like someone from my country. So I think we need to allocate a state to you <laughs> and give you a name, a Nigerian name. <laughs> and, and maybe get you dressed up like Dr. Ron. Uh, you know, you, you don't know what life would look like if you dress like this. <laughs> Praise God, you know, and we just met at the studio for recording what Pastor Jonathan Mila, and I heard him speak, and I was like, okay. I said, no American weapon formed against me will prosper, because when he began to speak, the kind of wisdom coming from him, I was like, boy, I better step up my revelation here today. <laughs> And somehow God just connected our hearts and he was like hey you need to come preach in our church and and that's how God just bonded our hearts together he owes me a visit and the kingdom church must release him to come this year amen he has to come over to our church amen dr. Ron had been with us pastor William McDowell has been with us Jonathan Miller had been with us you're the only one who's not been there amen and I want to say a big thank you to Pastor David and his precious wife for opening up this place for us. Would you please help me properly appreciate them? Thank you, sir. This church has about three campuses and they have amazing singers in this church. But the one I love the most is the Creole Choir. Did just take me back home. Lean and the entire team will love you so very much. Would you help me appreciate the music team here? Thank you, guys. Thank you, sirs. Thank you. They have also made available their volunteers. People have to sign up from work just to attend to us all here. Isn't this a generous and kingdom church indeed? Can you please help me appreciate all those who are serving the volunteers? My wife sends her regards. She couldn't make it down. My son is rounding up his school, getting ready to come to Florida to school. Uh, so she needed to be home with my son so he can focus on his studies and have emotional support. And um, I'm also honored to have several men of God whom we'll be recognizing later here. I want to thank all of you for coming around. Pastors in their rankings. God bless all of you for coming from across the United States. I honor your visit and I pray that God will reward it. In Jesus name can you just stretch your hands to the Lord and say father visit me today yes we're here for you Jesus yes we're just here for you father we just want you to visit us today we thank you father God we thank you father oh hallelujah father God only you can satisfy our hearts only you only you father Jacob's well will never do Oh, no, no, Jacob's well will never do. We came to drink from you today, Father. We just came to drink from you, Father. Glorify your name today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Only you can satisfy my only you can satisfy my Only you can satisfy 
you know the part of the song that I love so much is I, I see you already going very closely <laughs> hallelujah father we thank you luke chapter 11 in verse 1 luke chapter 11 in verse 1 the bible says and it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place that when he ceased to pray one of his disciples said to him Lord teach us to pray Lord teach us not to preach teach us not to sing teach us not to do ministry teach us to pray in, in actual fact, he didn't even say, teach us to know about prayer. He said, teach us not to know how to pray, but teach us to pray. Father, I pray for the blessing on your word today. And I pray that as we come into the school of prayer, you will indeed equip us to pray. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I want to welcome you to the 20th, 21st century. And more specifically, I want to welcome you to 2020 to 2030. This is going to be one of the most remarkable decades in your life. Yeah. Is that all right? Now, let me quickly say something here. If you're 20 years old right now, by the end of this de decade, you're going to be 30 years old. If you're 30, you're going to be 40. If you're 40, you're going to be 50. If you're 50, by 2030, you're going to be 60. The implication of what I'm just trying to share with you is that whatever it is that you need to do, you better do it in a hurry. Come on. Am I talking to somebody in the house of God here? You ain't got time to do the things that you've always said I'm planning to do. Whatever you've been planning to do in the season of vision, this is a season of execution. I mean, it was, it was just like a joke, um, you know, when we started the year 2010. I, I mean, I can remember then it was just like a joke, 2010. And, and, and just like a joke again, here we are, 2020. And I was like, when did we get into 2010? And now it's already 2020. And in the same vein, time moves at the speed that is incomprehensible. And so it is important for you to understand that there's something the scripture is saying to us, redeem time. What the scripture is asking you to do is buy back time. The reality is how do you buy back time? To buy back time implies that you need to do now what you should have done, including what you should be doing. You don't have time. I don't have time. Don't live like you have time. <laughs> so I want to steer you up to the place of prayer. So the Bible makes us to understand that we should redeem the time. And it's important that you understand the times and the seasons that you find yourself in. Because for everything there is a season and for every purpose there is a time that is allocated for that. It is critical that you understand the functionings of times and seasons. Thank you Lord Jesus. So as we look at 2020 to 2030, I was in the place of prayer and I began to ask the Lord. I said, Lord, what's, what's about to happen? And the Lord began, the, the key words that the Lord began to share with me was the Lord said to me, he said, son, get ready because there are going to be mega shifts things are going to be shifting in the technological world in the in the political arena in the church world things are going to literally shift by the end of this decade it will be difficult to believe that you began this decade the way it is because there will be major mega shifts in our landscape 
in our churches, things are literally going to shift. Churches won't be the same anymore. The church won't be the same. Our countries won't be the same. Who would have ever thought in 2000, the year 2000, that today Facebook will be what it is? Who would have ever thought that the kind of technological shifts that we are seeing will be happening in our day and in our time? It is incomprehensible what is about to come yet. And all truths are parallel. What that means is that the shifting you are seeing in society, the same shifting will be taking place in the church circle. Here are a few things that the Lord has asked that I share with you. I may not be able to go into the details because I need to really walk with, with time today. The first thing the Lord said to me is tell my children, this will be a year and a decade of mega shifts in many nations. Things are about to shift in our nations. What's about to happen in America? Nobody, if anyone is to tell you that this will happen in the United States, you won't believe it. God is about to literally take over the affairs of man and establish himself as a king of kings. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Nations are about to be shifted. Number two, this is going to be a year and a decade of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit leading to major awakenings. Watch this carefully. In churches you least expect. In places you least expect. Through people you least expect. You're about to see churches that are not so to say known becoming the hub of the move of God. Who would have ever thought that on the day of Pentecost that the visitation that was coming from God will come to an upper room and not a synagogue on the ground? I'm saying get ready because God is about to do something in and through you so much so that the people that never knew that someone like you can be used in the centerpiece of what God is about to do will be used to accomplish God's purpose on earth. Huh. Now let me say something else, number three. The Lord said to me, this will be a year and a decade for mega breakthroughs, for kingdom entrepreneurs, people who are kingdom minded, who are entrepreneurs who are into business. The Lord is saying he's going to give them mega breaks in their businesses in this new year and in this new decade. Get ready for a mega shift in your enterprise, in your entrepreneurial life. Things are about to literally shift. Number four. The Lord is saying I should declare to the body of Christ that this will be a year and a decade of remembrance and mega fulfillment of prophecies and prophecies. So I don't know who's been carrying a prophecy. I don't know who's been carrying a promise. And you've been waiting on the Lord and like, oh God, when is this going to come to pass? Things are about to come to pass. Promises are about to come to pass. Promises are just about to be fulfilled right before your face. Glory be to God. We're about to see mega growth in churches and ministries that have been working and have been waiting for the Lord to visit them. Suddenly, churches are about to start exploding in growth. And you're going to literally begin to ask the question, where are all these people coming from? Where are they coming from? The Lord is tearing their hearts and is bringing them towards the house. There are people who have been observing your church and your ministry for years and they've been taking their time because the time had not yet come for them to be a part of you. But we've just come into that season when supernaturally God will begin to steer the hearts of men. Glory be to God. One of the greatest things the Lord shared with me was the fact that we're going to see a mega harvest of young people come into the kingdom of God. This decade, we just literally, and listen, we're going to see young people coming through unconventional means. God is going to literally raise some churches to do unconventional things that will begin to cause there to be a mega harvest of young people coming to the church. Watch out. All kinds of young people are coming into the church. Straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, they're all coming into church. Tattooed and not tattooed. They're all coming. 
from our text Luke chapter 11 in verse 1 the disciples were observing Jesus they were just watching him they were they, they looked at Jesus and they saw how this man would look at the storm and say uh, peace be still I mean you speak to inanimate object he looked at the storm and said peace be still and the storm goes quiet and then he looked at a tree and he said um, I came to look for some fruit on you but I found nothing so uh, from now onward no one eats of you anymore and the tree responded by becoming weeded instantly I mean Jesus had bread in his hands and he had thousands to feed with it few loaves of bread and Jesus lifted them up and said father I thank you and he gave it to the disciples and give it to the crowd and literally bread began to multiply that still defies logic the disciples looked at Jesus and they were like what manner of man is this that even the wind and the storm they do obey him what what kind of man is this what makes him different and they came to one conclusion his prayer life they, they watch how that mark chapter 1 verse 35 they watch how that jesus will rise up early in the morning and the bible said jesus will leave the disciples and will go to a quiet place and there he will spend time in prayer at some other times Jesus will go to the mountain all alone and will pray all night they were watching on one of those occasions Jesus had gone to the mountain to go pray and the Bible said the disciples were on high on the high sea and the Bible said there was a storm and watch this carefully from the place of prayer Jesus came walking on water and the Bible said when he approached them they were like this must be a ghost and he said no no no, I'm not a ghost I'm Jesus and Peter said if it is you bid me to come and he said come and he began to walk on water I just wanted to let you know that there are people who will be walking over waters people are gonna be walking on water and, and there's gonna be something very unique to them they are people of prayer he came from the place of prayer walking on water what others were sinking in he was walking over because he came from the place of prayer follow me I just want to build up something here today the disciples looked at him and they were like master we love preaching but teach us to pray anyone can preach but very few can pray They said, Master, we see how you will come to a place where a girl is dead and you will just look at the girl and say, Felita Kumi, damsel, I say to you, arise. And the dead girl will come back to life. Teach us to pray. Teach me to pray. This was my heart cry 30 years ago. Teach me to pray. 31 years ago I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and I realized that the most important thing I needed to learn was not how to preach sir, but how to pray and so I decided to get books that will enable me to pray I began to read books by seven mighty prayer warriors and I began to buy books uh, by Father, Na, Father, Cla, Father Clary, Father Nash, John uh, Charles G. Finney and, and Judge Mula and I began to read books of people who really spend time to pray, pray and hide and I read about praying hide how that he prayed until his heart literally shifted so much so that the Queen of England said I fear not the military might of Israel of, of great, great Britain the only thing I fear is the prayer of a man called praying hide the Queen of England said I don't fear the military might of England I fear one thing and that's the prayer life of that man Everything has been digitalized except, except your prayer life. iPhones can pray for you. You can text your prayer. You have to pray. 
And here's something I wanted to let you know. We're here to pray for you. But the greatest thing I intend to accomplish by the time we're done here is to make sure you can pray by yourself. Relying on somebody else in this 21st century to pray for you is the greatest way to weaken your destiny. Everyone can promise you they are praying for you. Very few truly pray for you. You are your own greatest prayer warrior. So you had better learn how to pray by yourself. What would you do if you say you have me as your prayer warrior? Pastor Sam is always going to be there for me. What would you do when you text me, when you call me and I'm airborne and I can't respond to you and you have an emergency in your house? Someone is fainting. Someone is on that demonic attack and you need to lay hands on that devil and cast it out. Help me touch your neighbors and learn how to pray. Learn how to. Yeah, you have to learn how to pray. Hallelujah. So one of the things you need to learn and practice in this 21st century, in this year 2020, one of the things you need to learn how to do and do it is prayer. It is the most important thing you need to learn and practice in 2020, prayer. Number two, it is not just what you should learn and practice, it is what you should practice and teach others. So here's the dynamic involved in this conference. We are not just going to pray for you. We're going to pray with you. And then we're going to teach you how to go back home, take notes, and go back home and put groups together and begin to teach them how to pray. You become better at prayer when you begin to pray with a group. When you have an accountability group, it makes you pray. Praise God. What is prayer? I'm going to go from the basic of it all. I know there are men of God in the house, so this may not be a message for men of God. This is for children of God. Amen. 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 When we have ministers' conference, we'll bring something for men of God. Hallelujah. What is prayer? In simple terms, prayer is communicating with and communion with God. Prayer is communicating with God and communing with God. The import of that is that prayer is talking to and listening to God. Prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a dialogue. Hallelujah. In prayer, you speak to God and you listen to God. The most important aspect of prayer is listening to God. Because what he has to say is more important than what you have to say. So I'm going to be breaking down prayer for you so you can learn how to pray effectively. Because one of the challenges we're faced with today is that a lot of people are giving up on prayer because prayer looks mystical. Some people think that prayer is a game of chance. You pray today, if God is on his good side, he answers your prayer. On the other day, if you pray, God may not be too happy, so he doesn't answer your prayer. And sometimes if you make some requests to God, it may look like something that God has the ability to deal with. At some other times, your request may be too big. I mean, you imagine telling God that someone needs to be healed of cancer. That looks too big for God. Let's trust the medical science and not God for that. Uh, so, so you, you know, we've categorized some things. There are things we can talk to God about and there are some things that subconsciously something tells us don't talk to God about that you better trust the medical science than you trust God am I talking to somebody here the reality is God answers prayer I came here to let you know that God answers prayer and he answers prayer always at all times and God answers prayer concerning all things there's a call to prayer God is calling people to pray. Hallelujah. If you look at the scripture in Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. 
For everyone, this is what I love about the scripture. For everyone that asks it, can you beat this? This is God's word. For everyone that asks it, receive it. Not everyone that asks it may receive. Everyone that asks receives. Number two, the scripture says, and everyone that seeketh finds. And to him that knocketh, it shall be open. This is all in the affirmative. If you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. Telling you that God guarantees answers to prayers. But Pastor Sam, why don't I get my own prayer answered? I'm going to take you there sequentially. I'm trained as a scientist. And part of what we do is to try to prove things empirically. I like to know the science behind the thing. I like to know the, the science behind the working of certain things. So the first thing here we're seeing is that God is inviting us to pray. And it's critical for us to establish that. Prayer is not initiated by man. God initiated prayer. He invites you to pray. It is insultive for me to invite you to my house to come for dinner and then you arrive at my house and I have no food to offer you. It insults my person. If God invites you and I to pray and he doesn't have answers to our prayer, he ceases to be God. I want to say that again. If God invites you and I to pray, if God says, if you have cancer, call on me and I will answer you. And I call on God as is what requires. I act on scriptures and the cancer is not healed. Then I need to ask myself a question. What went wrong? In mathematics, there are certain things in equation we call constants. What that means is that these are not subject to variation. In the equation of prayer, when it comes to answers, God is a constant invariable factor. What that means is that the default setting of God is to answer prayer. What that implies is that the Bible says everything concerning our God is yea and amen. He said if you ask, he said I will answer you. He said if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. I am giving you a promise and I understand that you've done some of them so to say and you've not seen results and I'll tell you why. Glory be to God. Nothing hurts like even seeing pastors giving up on prayer these days. Man of God, you don't have an idea what I'm talking about. I'm seeing it's so sad. People who began in the spirit are perfecting in the flesh now. You will have pastors who will preach for months and not pray for it an hour. Messages are easy to come by these days. Gone are the days when, man of God, people will spend hours on their knees all night waiting for. And, and let me say this. That may sound old-fashioned. That's why some people are different. That's why some people command the grace that is upon their lives. You can go online and download and copy and change and twist here and there messages online. When you preach a message that was not born in the place of prayer, it will be very obvious to the crowd because it's a graceless message. When you preach it, it will carry no grace. Why do we have so much preaching but less lives being changed? Because the message coming from the altar to the pew is not a message born from the place of prayer. A message born from the head will reach the heads of men. But a message born from the spirit of God will reach the spirit of man and transform their lives. Oh come on somebody say teach me to pray Lord. Lord. 
Dr. Ron, you frequent my country. And, and doctor, you, you see what happens, Diana, when you come to my, you know what, Lynn, you'll be amazed to come to my country and find people singing. Sometimes, even those of us who are Nigerians are like, what kind of song is this? They sing in our local dialect. We have a lady they call Chioma. We have another lady they call Tokwe. And, and you know, they just sing no bad living, no effects on their songs, no modulation, no nothing. Just straight song. The dictions are so raw, Act, accent so strong. And sometimes when you hear their song for the first time, you want to just talk. When Nathaniel Bassi came out with, is your name in the book of life? Nobody thought he took him seriously. But all of a sudden, people just began to know, this guy's breaking through everywhere. What is the key? He's close to me. We walk together. Nathaniel said to me, say, Pastor Sam, what I cherish the most is my prayer life. There are people with greater voices. There are people who are more skillful than I am. When it comes to singing, they can go and reeves and all of that. They can do all of that. But there's no grace. No grace. And grace cannot be manufactured. It, grace is given. He gives that grace. He, he, oh, Kapo, shut up. Grace is given. Grace is given. You, you can't come and create grace on the stage. If you don't receive grace in the secret, you can create grace on the platform. Oh, come on, somebody touch your neighbor and say, you need to learn how to pray. You need, you need to learn how to pray. It's humbling to realize in my, I see things uh, across the world. I, I see some pastors, they just come around and, and, you know, they don't preach with all the energy. They don't preach with so much revelation, nothing too deep. A and you just see people coming. You just see people following them. A and nothing offends those who are theologically inclined than the fact that, listen, what, what's he preaching? Oh, what's he saying? And then, and you, you say, yeah, listen, listen, he, he is homiletically not correct. He is not exegically correct. Uh, no, 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 oh, come on. The laws of interpretation of scripture are wrong. What's he talking about? He's literalizing the Bible. And, and, and you know what, you know, and so you do all the theology, you bring all the homiletics, you bring all the hermeneutics, you bring all of that, and then here you are, the result doesn't speak. Because this person goes every day before God and, and say, God, I only have five loaves of bread. Lord, look at the people I have to feed with this loaf. Lord, I'm counting on you to multiply the influence of my bread. Let my bread reach more than what my hands can. Am I talking to somebody here? You've got a restaurant. You can feed 2,000. Someone has five loaves and is feeding 5,000. Don't you see that there's something about grace? And, and, and grace is given. You can fake the operation of grace. You, you can claim to have the grace of God when you don't have it. There is a general grace that brings salvation. There is specific grace that makes ministry effective. Paul will make statements like, unto me was this grace given. Unto me was this mystery given. And the key to it is prayer. Paul will make statements like, listen, Paul will make statements like, I pray in tongues more than all of you. Did you hear what Paul just said? I combine all of you together, all your time in prayer. I combine all of you together and single-handedly I can tell you I pray in tongues more than all of you. No wonder that man had abundance of revelation. No wonder that man had insight into things that the Bible, listen to how Paul puts it. Paul said, the things that I share, no man taught me. And I didn't copy it from the internet. I, I didn't go to copy a message I will preach on Sunday from the internet. I didn't buy sermons that I'm going to preach. No, no, no. They were given to me. I stayed in the place of prayer. They were given to me. 
I'm grace made. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he will exalt you. For he giveth grace to the humble. Did you hear what I just said? Right? He giveth what? And the greatest demonstration of humility is submission to prayer. When you get to pray, you are saying, God, I can do it by myself. When you kneel down to pray before going to work, you're saying, God, I'm not going to work trusting on my intellect. When you kneel down to pray before going to preach, you're saying, Lord, I'm not trusting in my ability to preach. I'm counting on your grace to make things happen. Am I talking to somebody in the house of God? Oh, come on, somebody say, Lord, teach me how to pray. How to pray. So there is a call to prayer. I will need some time here. There's a call to prayer. In Mark chapter 11 verse 24. Therefore I say unto you. What things. Things. So prayer covers things. What things soever. You desire. When you pray. Believe that you receive them. And you shall have them. I want you to have things. Did you hear what the Bible says? I, I want you to have things. Can anybody tell me what in things include what? Everything. Everything, right? Cars, good houses, whatever your heart desires. Now God said, I want you to have things. Don't allow your religious mindset to excuse you from what I want you to have. It gives me great pleasure when you have all things so you are not distracted by their absence so you can focus on me. You didn't hear what I just said, right? And, and Pastor D, I, you know what I love about your church? The balance. The balance. I, I watch your messages. I see how you teach your, mess, your members how to pray and you teach them also about enterprise development, how to make money and stuff like that. You know why? There is a problem that the American church needs to quickly at attend to. We are praying for revival and we are ignoring people's needs. <laughs> Man of God, how do you want me to be praying for a move of God when I don't have money to put gas in my... Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't have money for gas in my car. Now listen, revival is about, it's a spiritual impact. Revival is about me praying more. It's about me reaching out to people. But if I'm going to reach out to souls, I need to pay. Amen. Now listen, if revival comes and I need to go and preach the gospel in Africa, I, I'm not going to get to the airline and say, hallelujah. going to get to the airline company and sh uh oh kick uh oh uh oh waka hey 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 holy ghost and and you know i love the airline people they will allow you when you're done with it. hey hey are you all right now sir first question where are you going to africa Fantastic. Sir, can we have your ticket? Ha! <laughs> Matter of God, I paid $8,000 to be here. Nobody looked at my, my flyer and said, Oh, you are pastor, sir. And we see that you're going for a great thing in America. Now, now, oh, hallelujah. Now you can go. What, what we are ignoring and we're praying for, that's why revival tarries. Let me show you the order of revival in scripture if we call it revival. If you go to Joel chapter 2, which is where the Bible says, in the last day, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That is in verse 28. Before verse 28, the verses before, the Bible says, I will make sure you eat in plenty. You have food, you have surplus. The Bible says, when you are eaten, when you've eaten and you are full, then you shall bless the name of the Lord your God. Can you see the sequence? 
I'm going to revive your finances. I'll make sure I take care of your bills. When I do that, when you come to my presence, you are not distracted by the need to pay a bill. Am I talking to somebody here? So I've seen people praying for a move of God when they need to move their house. I've seen people praying that heavens will open and the Holy Ghost will come and that's going to happen here today. But the Lord said, what things soever, what do you desire? I'm your father. I care about even your mundane needs. I care about what bothers you. Do you need healing in your body? He said, I care about that. How can you pray for three hours when you have a tingling sensation moving all over your body? How can you focus on prayer when you have uh, an arthritic pain? How can you focus on prayer with some of the diseases and the infirmity? You can't focus on prayer. So God says, I want to deal with that so you can focus on this. Oh God, my time is set. Okay, so there's a call to prayer. In John chapter 14, in verse 13 and 14. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Can you hear that? The ticket is open. Whatsoever. Whatsoever means what? So whatsoever, whatsoever you want. He said, I, I, I'll give it to you. It, it's a affirmative promise it said whatsoever things you desire and now again in mark in john chapter 14 it said whatsoever ye shall ask in my name that i will do that the father may be glorified oh my god can you see that when we say father take all the glory can we see how jesus says the father gets glorified the father gets glorified when answers come to your prayer when you receive answers for your prayers the father gets glorified and I'm praying today that the Father will answer you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So watch this carefully. It says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask, this is it again. If ye shall ask anything, anything, oh God. You need someone to teach you the Bible wrongly to miss out on this. This is so simple. If ye shall ask anything in my name, not I may do it. I will do it. Ask anything in my name, I will do it. One of the things we need to repent over today is, is that of limiting the Holy One of Israel. Hallelujah, I need to move quickly now. Now listen to what the Bible says in John chapter 15 verse 7. The Bible says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what, this is the one that shocks me. Because somehow theologians have tried to take this away from us. Yes sir. Because we're told that the only things we, God answers us are the things that he wills. But here's something here. Look at what the Bible says in John 15 7. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will. Did you hear what I just said right now? You shall ask what what? Is this in the Bible? You shall ask. I know you've been asking for what I will, but, but I'm asking you what do you also will? Now, now, you see, whenever you had teachers like this, the need for balance makes some of us to say, uh, but, but not, before you go too far, but let me balance it up for you. If my words abide in you, what that is just simply telling you is that because my word dwells in you, my will dwells in you, and my will becomes your will. Simple. Simple. That was why Paul the Apostle said, we have our senses exercised to know what to do. Yeah. 
I, and it, just laying the foundation. Is that okay? Just laying the foundation. Praise God. All right. I started sharing with them online, and I'm sure some of you have gotten this. So we've seen the call to prayer. Please permit me to flow with this. Now I want to share with you the actors involved in prayer. There are seven actors involved when it comes to prayer. Now this is where prayer gets tricky. We've seen the fact that God has invited us to pray and he's promised us he's going to answer us. But then when you read the scripture, you're hearing if you pray, I will answer you and all of that. Now you're going to start seeing how prayer works. All right? And you're going to see that somehow you've been blaming God over the fact that he has not answered your prayer. Whereas your, your prayer has been answered from the, in fact, let me say this. Your prayer, prayer was answered when it was still in the thought realm. But Pastor Sam, why haven't I gotten my answers? Because you don't understand the key actors in the world of prayer. Number one actor in the world of prayer is God. That's the one who invites us to pray. Is that okay? He invites us to pray. So he is the first actor in the world of prayer. And don't forget, he's the constant invariable factor. What that means is that God will always answer prayer. That was why it was said to Daniel, Daniel, on the first day when you prayed, your prayer was answered on the first day. But the result came on the 21st day. What happened to 20 days? Well, Daniel, you're about to understand now that from the time you prayed, I answered, there were other actors involved in the arrival of the prayer at your doorstep. Now, here's the problem. You have blamed yourself and you have blamed God when you needed to give attention to the other actors in the world of answered prayer. So number one actor in the world of prayer, God, who is constant and has made a promise, he will always answer. We've seen that from his word. Number two actor in the world of prayer is you, man, I'm talking about you, the woman, who has to pray and talk to God because God will not just give it to you because you have a need for it. God will give it to you because you asked for it. Because the principle of prayer requires that you must ask if it has to be given. Is that clear? It's a principle. So don't say, but doesn't God understand what I need? He understands. He feels your pain. But he's given you a protocol of access to his presence. Ask what you need. All right? Okay, so let's take it a little bit further. So the first actor in the school of prayer is God. The second actor is man who is invited to pray to God. Number three actor is channels. The channels. Human channels. Very important, the physical channels that God will use to answer your prayer. Is that okay? And I've been able to share this with them online. Take note of this. If you pray for a job, an enterprise will give you a job. You don't get letters of employment from heaven. Is that okay? So when you pray, say, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, your word says, your word says, and your word says, and so Lord, I ask for a job. And the Lord said, daughter, done. It's done. So you pray, I've answered. Okay, so Lord, why am I not having the job? Oh, sweetheart, you need to know that there is someone needs to interview you. Someone is going to interview you. And then even when the interviewing panel says, okay, someone is going to write your letter of employment. Is that all right? That tells you now that God has answered, you have prayed, but there's a human channel that needs to be taken into account. I call them institution, I call them instruments, and I call them individuals. Is that these are the channels, individuals, institutions, and instruments. Is that okay? God uses individuals, institutions, and instruments to answer your prayer. Don't ever leave the channels uncovered in the place of prayer. See, you've overly focused on God and yourself 
and you've blamed yourself for the lack of answers to your prayer, you've blamed God for the lack of answers to your prayer, forgetting that your prayer had been answered, but the human channels involved are the reasons why you've not seen answers yet. And you left them uncovered. Are you getting what I'm saying here? So when you begin to pray, you don't just say, Father, I thank you for a job. And Lord, I thank you also for every man, every woman that will be instrumental. Yes, Lord. The interviewing panel, Lord, I cover them up. I, I, I ask that in the name of Jesus, the Bible says, you are the father of all spirits. The Bible says the heart of kings are in your hands. You move it with us wherever you want. So Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the interviewing panel. I pray for the human resource. I pray for the institution itself. That Lord, they will do your will. Your, am I talking to somebody here? Your will be done on earth in that organization concerning me as it is already settled where? Is this helping you at all? So I, was, I had to apply for a 10-year visa to go to the United Kingdom, for the United Kingdom. And this is not a good time to apply for visa in my country. Uh, those who are from Nigeria will tell you that. And, and, and so bad, man of God, I applied for a 10-year visa and I just finished a building project. So I pushed my money into the building project that we just finished. So I had no money in my account. And you know, if you want to go for a two-year visa, Nigerians will tell you how much you need to have in your account. And coupled with the fact that I had just gotten, someone had just called me and said, sorry, Pastor, the UK Embassy just sent to me and said they're not giving me a visa because I didn't have sufficient amount in my account. And I said, how much did you have in your account? And the person was like, I had five million. And I didn't have a million. And I applied for 10 years. And I kept announcing on television, on broadcast, hey, United Kingdom, I'm coming. <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm coming. Get your family together, I'm coming. And when I'm done with the broadcast, something's like, <laughs> how would you explain? And so gradually, the enemy began to suggest to me statements to make in case it fails. And nothing dilutes your faith like options. The moment you begin to embrace options, you are nullifying possibilities. Sorry, I'm just trying to be basic. This is just supposed to be a basic school of prayer. Is that okay? Is this, is this okay or it's too low for you? Maybe I should step it up to the pastoral level kind of teaching on prayer. All right? So, doctor, I was busy telling people online, hey, I'm coming to London. I'll be there. Hey, you saw me. I mean, I was loud. I'm coming. The Lord is coming. <laughs> and I was looking at time. Time was passing by. Not, nothing messes up with your faith like the passage of time. Nothing makes you to begin to reconsider what you have said, like the fact that you're looking at deadline approaching. You, you said it was possible until when it was about two hours more to the time, and you and I are like, oh no, Lord, I'm not sure this is going to be possible. And you know, and, and you know something, about, something about the enemy, he wants you to get close to that moment, he delays it to that moment, because one, one pinch of doubt thrown into a, an ocean of faith dilutes your faith. So I just kept on preparing. And guess what? The conference was going to be on a Saturday. As a Thursday, my visa hadn't come out yet. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Friday morning, I got a call. A Thursday morning, I got a call. Hey, Sam. It's Thursday afternoon. Your visa is ready. I said, really? And I had to rush over. Then ticket. For me to buy the ticket. By the time I was told how much, because I was only left with business class, which is, and, and pretty much it was too close, and I'm going to route through London to come over here, the prices are really gone up. 
And I said, you know what, I'm going. And so I showed up on Saturday morning. <laughs> I arrived in London on the day of the conference. Straight from the airport to the conference. What am I saying? If your faith will hold on to it and doubt will make you change your mind, you will see what you've always desired. Does that make sense? <laughs> All right. So the actors in the school of prayer, the first actor is who? Second actor? Number three? Human channels. Is that okay now? Never forget this. Human channels include also institutions, instruments, and individuals. Is that okay? All right. So God can use individuals and never leave any of this uncovered. Never leave them. And that's the, trust me, if you will look at the equation of prayer, you will discover this is where you always leave it out. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you because this year I'm getting married. Lord, I, Lord, I thank you because I have... Lord, I, I'm getting married to a beautiful woman. Then, Lord, I thank you because I'm getting married to a handsome guy. Yeah, Lord, I'm marrying a boys. Ha! Ah, hallelujah. Ah, I see him. Okay. <laughs> now, watch this. Ruth, God has answered your prayer for Boaz to be your husband. You prayed that he should be your husband. God has answered you. But, but you know something? If you don't go and cross his path, this guy will keep... You know what Boaz said? Boaz said to her, I've been observing you. I see you every day here. You're such a, you're such a beautiful woman. And I've heard so much about you. You're such a wonderful lady. You're so faithful. Except that nothing ever told me that I should think about you as a wife. My will wasn't inclined in that direction. Someone needs to move my will in that direction for me to start having consideration in that direction. Whilst I was seeing you, I was seeing you as a good person for my enterprise. I saw you as a good staff. I was already thinking of what next job to give you. I was trying to make you now become, instead of a contract staff, I want you to become a permanent staff. Little did he know that that was going to be his wife. But glory be to God for a mother who knows how to teach her daughter in the Lord how to pray effectively. She said, my daughter, you're going to go to him tonight and cross his path. And when he wakes up and finds you there, he will ask you a question. Why are you here? Tell him straight away what the will of God is. That you might be my king's man redeemer. Tell him what the will of God is. What I'm sharing with you applies to several aspects of life. There are people you are thinking should know. They won't know until you cross their path. I need to move quickly. <laughs> oh God. Number four actor in the school of, in the world of prayer is the devil. Satan himself. Okay. So Paul the apostle puts it this way. He said once and again I wanted to come to you. He says Satan hindered us. Did you hear that? This is an apostle of such reputation. With such reputation. Paul a man who... Paul will look at a girl who was possessed by a spirit of divination and Paul will say to that spirit, come out of her and at an instance, that demonic spirit will leave that girl and Paul will set her free. Paul said, I wanted to come, not once, once and again. He said, but Satan hindered me. Is that okay? This is to let you know that there is a fourth person involved when it comes to answered prayer. Never take for granted the devil himself. Is that okay? He will want to resist you. He will want to hinder you. He will want to stop what God wants to do in your life. Why? On this domain called earth, the devil has rulership. When God created the earth, the Bible said the heavens of the heavens belong to God. The earth has he given to the sons of men. So the earth was given to man. And the Bible says man handed over the earth to who? Yeah. To Satan. Is that okay? That has not been retrieved yet. 
That's why the Bible says up till now, the whole world still lies in wickedness. All right? So what that tells you is that when you're praying for God to answer something, you prayed, God has answered, and the human factors, the instruments that God wants to use are available. You want to travel, you ask God to provide someone that will help you to travel. The person is willing to help you. The person is ready to help you. But here you are, all of a sudden you suddenly began to notice that you have the sheep, you have the people who are willing to go across to the other side, and here you are faced with a storm you can't explain. You remember that in scripture? They were faced with a storm they couldn't explain. Where is the storm coming from? Engineered by the devil, which takes me now to the last point. Not just the devil, you have agents of the devil and you have nature that can be used. Three things. You have the devil, you have nature, and you have agents of the enemy. Never leave all of this uncovered when you're praying. I gave an example online how that I ordered for a camera from uh, a video camera from Miami and it arrived in my country. It was in my city, but it took two weeks or thereabout before I got it. And someone had the guts to call and say, You know what, your camera is with me. And if you come and sort out some things, I will give you the camera. I'm like, You mean my camera is with you? It took me a short time to get it from the U.S., but now it's taking me a longer time to get it in my domain. Because I was more concerned about where it's coming from, I did not take into account where it's coming to. Is it possible that what you are looking up to heaven for is already in your locality? Is it possible that what you're looking up to God for is already within your domain? It's time to begin. The Bible says if you want to take what belongs to the strong man, you bind him. It's time to begin to say in the name of Jesus, I bind the powers that are holding on to the things that are destined to be mine. In this season, in the name of Jesus, this is very important. Let me run through quickly. The five attitudes of people that pray and get results the attitude that they possess the five major attitude maybe before I share that with you I shared with them the five ingredients of effective prayer five ingredients of effective prayer from Mark chapter 11 verse 24 what things soever you desire ah I wish I could touch on that a bit what things soever you desire I'm talking about the ingredients of effective prayer why some people are very effective in the place of prayer and some are not the first thing the bible says is that if you want to pray and get result you need to crystallize your desires what things soever you desire do you have a properly articulated desire and by the way the word desire there is a very powerful word that word desire there is something that you are yearning for something that is of great interest to you Meaning you don't go to God with wishes. You go to God with desires. A desire is something that is consuming to you. A desire is something that you are obsessed with. Something you really want to see God do. So the first thing the Bible says is, when, and if you notice, listen, if you use other translations of the Bible, this is where the error came from. If you use other translations of the Bible for Mark chapter 11 verse 24, they take off desire. They go, yes, that's where the problem came from. Check all other translations of the Bible. I'm not sure you'll find two or three that supports the King James. And that was where the trouble came from. All other translations tells you whatever things you pray about, they go straight to prayer. But the problem is, many of us have come to the place of prayer to pray and find out that we don't even know what to pray about. The first thing to do is to properly articulate in your heart what you desire to pray about. What do you desire? What do you really want to see God do? I always say this, if it doesn't touch your heart, will it touch the heart of God? Properly articulate your desire. Let it be something that is of great concern to you. 
When you meet with Anna in the place of prayer, Anna went on her knees and the Bible says she began to pray. Her husband said to her, sweetheart, why don't you just come, let's have some food. She was like, no, you can go ahead and eat. And eat. You don't have the same desire that I have. I know you wish to have a son. I desire to have a son. That's the difference. You can feel cool in Shiloh. You can feel cool in the temple because you wish to have a son. I can feel cool because I desire to have a son. And the difference became clear. The one with the desire prevailed in the presence of God. What is your desire? In this conference, we're going to give you room to pray. What is your desire? Glory be to God. So the first thing here, the Bible said you need to have a desire. What things soever you desire when you pray. So the second ingredient of effective prayer is prayer. Pray. There's so many who talk about prayer who don't pray. I'm planning to pray. It's not prayer. Prayer is prayer. You pray when you want to pray. You don't think about prayer. You pray. When you have a desire, the next thing to do is to engage prayer. And I like the way someone put it. He said, don't just come to the place of prayer without prayer in your prayer. I hear people say, I spent the whole hour praying. And I said, really, what did you pray about? Well, I just prayed. It is a prayer in your prayer that God answers. Was there prayer in the prayer? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's fantastic. Jesus said, shut up. Can we talk? What is the prayer? Well, what is the prayer? And he said that I may have my side. He said, you just pray. Now have it. How about all you? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What was all of that about? That got my attention, but what is the prayer? I hope this helps you. Yes. Hallelujah. So the Bible says, what is whatsoever you desire when you pray. Number three, believe. Believe. So when you pray, the Bible says you should believe. Is that okay? Yes. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, the Bible says, whosoever must come to God must believe first. Is that he what? He is. Not he was. Not he shall be. No, no, no. I believe in the God who he is. He is my healer right now. He is my redeemer right now. He is my way maker right now. He is my burden bearer right now. He is Shiloh, my holy tranquilizer right now. He that must come to God must first believe that God is. Amen to Jesus. So as I come to the presence of the Father, I already believe in my heart that he is here. I believe in my heart he is here to heal me right now. I believe he is my Jehovah Rapha. I believe he is my Jehovah Jireh. I, I believe he is my, my strengthener. I believe he is my quickener. I believe he is the burden bearer. I believe he is the one who makes a way for me. I believe he is my oasis in the desert of life. I believe he is the one who takes away the pains that I carry. I believe he is the mountain mover. He is the way maker, the pathfinder, the train setter. I believe he is my trailblazer he is he is I already told myself I don't want to preach here today but I feel like I'm going to be preaching in the evening but I, I feel something coming close here and I just want to stay in the teaching mode amen it's not easy <laughs> I want to preach amen oh but come and touch your neighbor say he is Oh, he that must come to God must believe that he is right now. Amen. He is able. Hallelujah. You must believe that he is faithful. Hallelujah. You must believe that he is willing right now. You must believe that he is able, faithful, willing. You must believe that he is a mighty, mighty to save. You must believe that he is the lifter up of our head. You must believe that he is the strength now of Israel. Somebody shout, he is. He is. I believe in the God who is. 
not the God who was and not the God who shall be take it down a bit Mary and Martha met with Jesus Lazarus their brother was in the grave and Jesus was going to bring them into the concept of the God who is and Jesus said to them he said your brother will leave again and you know what Mary and Martha said they said yes Lord at the resurrection because we believe in the God who shall be and Jesus said to her Mary and Martha I'm, listen raising Lazarus is the smallest thing my greatest problem is your concept of God and I'm not going to raise him until I deal with your concept and I need to bring you to the understanding that the God I'm about to introduce to you, the miracle that I'm about to introduce to you is not what shall be, but what is. Amen. And he said, listen, I am not, I'm not going to raise him at the resurrection. I am right now the resurrection and the life. He brought them to the now God for faith. Now faith he is now God. Amen. And as soon as he brought them to the concept of the now, he said, you can roll away the stone. Meaning the stone God wants to deal with, the things that God wants to deal with is waiting for your concept of God to be aligned with the noun concept of God. <laughs> it's going to take us another year to meet, so I want to make sure you have what it to... You know what, you know what the Lord said to Elijah? Eat for the journey is long. So I want to make sure you carry along with you something that can take you through the year. Something you're going to be listening to. Something you're going to be looking back to. And remember the concept of prayer. That anyone that must come to God. Before you come to him. Remember he is there. Before you come to God. He is there. He is present. He is able. He is willing. He is. He is. My provider. He is. My healer right now. So the, the third thing there is, you must believe, number four, receive. This is the one that confuses. What things soever you desire, number one, when you pray, number three, believe, right? Number four is what? Wait a minute. He said number four, receive, and then number five, he said, have. All right, so I get it. You don't have it until you receive it. You didn't get what I just said right now. You, you don't have it until you receive it. That's the way it works in the kingdom. Lord, I receive it now. And this is the way it works. I receive my healing right now. I receive my child right now. I receive the visa right now. I receive, yes, right now. Now the Bible says if you receive it, you will have it. It is undoubtable. This is guaranteed that if you can first receive it, you will have it. Is that okay? Now here's where the problem is. You pray, you believe, and then here's where the problem is. You don't receive what you want to have. So when you don't have, you begin to doubt the entire process. Not knowing that in the chain, there was something missing. You failed to receive. There are a few attitudes you need to put together. You must have if you want to pray effectively. Take note of this. Number one, the first attitude of people who pray effectively is that they pray. The first attitude of people who pray effectively is that they pray. Don't think about prayer. Pray. Don't talk about prayer. Pray. Pray. There's no substitute for prayer. My prayer can't replace your prayer. There are things God wants to do and he won't reveal them to you until you come to pray. How did all this come about? Prayer. It was in the place of prayer I received a word, pray with your church for five days. That singular instruction has led to all of this. I go back to Nigeria next week, Saturday, we will be in my city hosting this same conference. Three weeks later, I'll be in the biggest city in my country hosting the same with Pastor Nathaniel Bassey. 
Canada is already calling that we come do the same in Canada. Australia is calling that we come do the same thing. All of that came from the place of prayer. Would you make up your mind to begin to pray and talk less about prayer and pray more? There is a move of God coming in this church. Lean, I'm sure the leadership of the church, not pastor, I'm sure the leadership of the church will take this to everyone in the church. There is something I see. Let me just describe what I saw. I, I, I see like snowballs of fire just jumping out of, you know how, what happens when a volcanic eruption is taking place? You know how the snowballs of fire just keep moving out from that crater? That's exactly what I'm seeing here. That's what I'm seeing. And, and that volcanic thing is going to be engineered through prayer. And it's going to begin with you and Lean and a few others and, and the instrumentalists who are going to say, listen, we need to pray. And let's, let's not talk about it. Can we begin to pray? There's something about prayer. If few of us begin to pray, others will join us. This is the 12th year of this church. It's a governmental year. And there's no way to establish a thing than through prayer. You can't power a great destiny with a weak prayer base. The future of this church is going to be predicated on a strong prayer altar. And God, your pastor has a burden for prayer in this house. Your pastor wants to see prayer. That's why he opened this place to us. And it is my hope and prayer that the residue of prayer, the residue of the grace of prayer that we walk with, I pray that that will be in this house and will be fun to a whole new thing. That by the, by the end of this year, this place will be known for a place where prayer takes place every day. People want to pray. They just need to know where they can go to. He said, my house shall be called not the house of singing, not the house of instrumentation. My house shall be called not the house of preaching. My house shall be called the house of what? Prayer. Let's give the church back to the owner and let the church be now available for why he established the church. He said, my house, the first proof that it is my house is that one thing you're going to see in my house is that you're going to see prayer. Not preaching, not singing, not dancing. No, no, no. All of these things are okay. He said, but my house, the way you know it's my house. That was why when he came into the temple, the Bible said he drove those who were in the temple who were buying and selling, doing activities. He drove them out. It's time to drive out what does not matter in the church and bring in what really matters. I see snowballs of fire flowing out of this place. And it's going to be engineered through prayer. So the five attitudes of highly effective people in the place of prayer, number one is that they pray. Number two is that they pursue what they are praying for. They pursue it relentlessly. Is that okay? James chapter 5 in verse 16 to 18. The Bible says Elijah prayed again. You pursue what you're praying for. Number three, you persist and persevere. You persist and persevere. You don't quit when you're praying for something. You don't give up until you see it. We gather every day to pray. We gather every week to pray. And we will continue to pray until we see what we're praying for. Elijah prayed for rain to fall. The Bible said when he went the first time, his servant went the first time and didn't see anything. He said, go again. Go again. Pray again. Seek again. Knock again. We need to continue to pray until we see what we're praying for. Highly effective people in the place of prayer, they pray, they pursue, they persist and persevere, they prevail. That's something I love about them. They prevail. They don't stop until they ultimately see what they are praying concerning. Jacob wrestled with an angel until he prevailed. I'm not quitting until I see what I'm praying for. Finally, they produce results. If you read the book of James chapter 5 in verse 16 to 18, in the last verse, verse 18, the Bible says Elijah prayed again and the sky gave rain and the land produced its crops. Take note of this. As a result of prayer, there was productivity. The rains came. The rain of the Spirit. Not only that, the Bible says the land produced. Businesses flourished. Things began to happen. 
we don't stop until we see what we're praying for. God gave me a promise concerning my daughter. We were christening my son on the day we were giving him a name. As we're naming my son, I looked up. And all of a sudden, I had a vision, open vision. And I saw a girl. And I loved her so very much. And the Lord said to me, on the day we were naming my son, this is this 2004, when, whilst we were naming my son, I just saw. Everybody was busy naming and I just saw my daughter. And the Lord said to me, your next child is going to be a girl. Oh, instantly I called my pastors who were very close to me and I said, you know what? My next child is going to be a girl. Then I thought it was going to happen a year after. A year after nothing. Two years after nothing. And I began to say, Lord, you showed me a girl. Lord, you have to, you have to bring it to pass. No, that's who you are. That's your character. You answer prayer. And you know, the only thing is, if I don't see it, but if I saw it, you're going to do it. And I began to pray. Lord, I need you to answer my prayer. And I began to get scripture, strong reasons to back up my request. Kept on praying, 4 a.m. every day. I will not give up. You know, in the process, man of God, it got so bad that people will come and say, hey, Pastor Sam, some of my leaders are here. People will come and say, hey, Pastor Sam, you know, whilst you were preaching, uh, after you finished preaching, I came and I sat on the chair that you sat on. And she said, and the woman will testify and say, and Pastor, I went back home and that very month was when I missed my period, the month after. Somebody will say, Pastor, when you dropped your suit, I took it and I put it on. And that was when we conceived. And someone would say, Pastor, the other day I just touched the hem of your trouser. And that was, and I said, guys, stop all this. Wait a minute. I don't get it. I, I, you touched what I wear and you have a baby and I'm waiting on God. You sat on my seat and wait, 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 what, what's, God, what's going on? People would say, Pastor, we just came to put our hands on the altar. And that was how God did it for us. And I'm like, God, how about me? And Lord said, I just want you to seek me. And I want to see how long you will stay. Can you hold on to the same topic in the place of prayer? Or are you quick to change the subject in the place of prayer because of the passage of time? How many of you remember Anna who prayed for the coming of our Lord Jesus? For decades she had only one prayer point that the Messiah will come. One prayer point for decades. One prayer point for decades. How long can you stay in the place of prayer? Do you have stay in power? <laughs> Prophetic prayer tribe is time for us to begin to pray at a whole new level. Hallelujah. So they prevail, they produce results. Now quickly, I want to say something. And I'm going to pray with you now. The Lord wants me to introduce something to you that I guess most of you are aware of. One of the major reason why, reasons why Jesus was very effective in the place of prayer was because Jesus understood the two dimensions of prayer. Which is the royal dimension of prayer and the priesthood dimension of prayer. And I'll just share this and I'll pray with you. I really want to make sure you get a lot for the time you spend in here. There's a royal dimension to prayer and there's a priestly dimension to prayer. And I just want to introduce you to that concept of prayer so that you can be more effective in the place of prayer. Revelation chapter 1 in verse 6. Revelation chapter 1 in verse 6. The Bible says he had made us. So not that he's going to make us. You are already made kings and priests unto our God. Please take note of this. Someone say with me, I'm a king. You can call yourself a queen. That's okay. <laughs> now, he has made us to be what? Kings and what else? Priests. All right? Unto our God and unto his father. And the Bible said, to him be glory and dominion forever. Revelation chapter 5 verse 10. The Bible was now reporting it. You made them a kingdom and priest for our God. They will rule as kings on the earth. Now, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, 
the way he prayed and the reason why he got result. I'm about to show you a scripture that will help you. Hebrews chapter 7 in verse 25. Don't forget this. We are already made kings and we're already made priests. Is that okay? So I'm going to share with you why a lot of Christians have a problem with prayer because we're praying from the paradigm of outsiders or some of us pray from the paradigm of children or slaves. So I'm going to show you how kings pray and I'm going to show you how priests pray. All right? Watch this carefully. Look at how the Bible puts it in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Therefore, talking about Jesus, he is able, this is very powerful, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. Oh God. Jesus, watch this, he has the ability to save to the uttermost. The reason why Jesus is effective to save, watch this, look at how the Bible puts it. He is able to save to the uttermost. The Amplified Version puts it this way. Completely, perfectly, finally, and for all the time, for all time and eternity. Those who come to God through him, since he always, he is always living to make petition to God and intercede with him and intervene for them. Oh. Okay, so let's take it down. Let me break it down. Jesus is able Everything you saw Jesus, Jesus demonstrate his ability to do. The Bible says he was able to do that for one simple reason. Because he leave it and make it intercession. Okay, don't miss this now. Don't miss this. I know this is going to be totally new to you in the place of prayer. The reason why you saw Jesus manifest and demonstrated the, the kind of power he demonstrated. The Bible says he demonstrated that royal power. He was able to do all of that in the realm of royalty because he intercedes. What that tells you is that his intercessory base, his prayer life, powers his ministry. Get this right. His priestly life powers his kingly life. He is able to save because he intercedes. Oh, come on. I'm going, to, I'm going to, I know it'll take a while. We've downplayed on that. That's why we're having so much casualty in the church. He is able because he intercedes. The whole of that scripture is summed up this way. He is, if you see him able to do anything, it's because he prays. I'm going to say that again. What he is able to do is because he prays his prayer life which has to do with your priestly life the job of a priest is to intercede the job of a king is to exercise decree are you catching that now all right so here's what i want you to know the priestly life of jesus powered his kingly life his priestly life he is able to save as a priest because he intercedes. He is able to save as a king because he intercedes as a priest. Get that right. I'm going to break it down so you're going to get it. He is able to save as a king. He's able to demonstrate power, to heal the sick, to do all of that as a king because he intercedes as a priest. I'm going to bring it home to you. So his secret prayer life made his public prayer life to be effective. His private life with God powered his public life with men. His successes in the secret place powered his successes in the public domain. His secret intercession powered his public mission. What that means was that secret prayer gave him public power. Therefore, let me bring it home to you. You cannot fail as a priest in the spiritual realm and succeed as a king in the physical realm. Let me bring it home. If you fail as a priest in engaging the heavenly realm consistently, you will not succeed for too long in influencing the earthly realm as a king in your domain. <laughs> 
what that comes up to is this more prayer more power more power more impact more impact more influence and the greater your influence the greater the strength of your kingship